and welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. I'm Michael Bryant with you till 5 o'clock. Daily debrief coming up at that time. Don't forget, we are in two cases live right now. Fact three, if you want to include California with Charles Merritt, the jury is still in the deliberation phase for the penalty for the man found guilty of four counts of murder. I think I have a moment here to bring in my, my uh, next guest here, Joseph Tully. Joseph, you're with me. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Good to see you. I, I needed some help from the West Coast because I got two New York guys here. So I needed, as a California practicing attorney, I needed some help on the California side. We got both coasts covered here. So, uh, Joseph, you've been watching this, this, this uh, unusual proceeding here. Have you had an experience where, where there's a slow plea, as they call this, where the, the defendant is really just facing a penalty phase on a charge, in this case, much less than he was originally to be tried on? Yes, uh, it's unusual, but the circumstances do arise. And it's really where there's no question as to guilt, but you want to present all of the facts, we call it mitigating evidence, to, to the judge or to the public in a way such that it might affect the, what, what's at issue in the case, which is the sentencing. And, and you know, we're going to see how that plays out. I have to say right now, uh, if I had a correct buzzer to buzz or ding, Sanford Rubenstein, guess what's happening to the jury? Sequester. Sequester. Just told that. Hey, by the way, tonight, you know, uh, your accommodations are on us, the uh, the county there in Texas. I would think so, they should have done that before they of, even seated Of course them they should have. I mean, that's that's unfair, and it's uh, it's an <laughs> extra hardship. Sequestering is a hardship enough. And you really, are you surprised, let me ask you, Dan, that they're sequestering in this case? Uh, I am. There, there, something seems to have arisen that changed the dynamic of the trial that we, we're not privy to. But it does seem unusual because um, this just was, doesn't was no, seem was to no be, accounting for it. Yeah, I mean, normally it's an excessive publicity uh, type situation. Maybe we're going to find out. We're going to get to the bottom of this. We have tremendous people uh, working this thing on the ground, and we're going to find out exactly what's going on. But something seems to have changed, as Dan suggested. <clears throat> that is a, a chunk of the prosecution's opening statement. Kelly Hicks there uh, in this this really. Uh, frightening case about a nanny assistant who by all accounts was was kind of randomly selected in a break-in a burglary gone way wrong and if you believe the prosecution this person was abducted uh, and uh, ultimately killed uh, I've got a great panel here with me to, to talk about this case as we are again waiting they're in a break there in that particular case in uh, in Florida Joseph Tully let me start with you for five hundred dollars I feel like a game show I got so many contestants here um, let me let me ask you this, sir. Is she getting the point across? It can be kind of a convoluted uh, story here. How's she doing? I think she's doing very good. I think the defense is going to have a tour cut out for um, them. She's laying out a very clear defense or a very clear uh, prosecution. And I, I'm interested to hear how the defense is going to counter this. So, Daniel, what, what do you think she needs to tell this jury? I mean, again, do you want to keep it short and sweet, hit the high points? I mean, she's, she, she goes on for a time, and we're going to listen to some more of it coming up. But what, what do you want to do with a case like this? Well, uh, I've never been a prosecutor. I was a born defense attorney. But I think that where the evidence is overwhelming, uh, I think that a, a methodical approach is in order. And I think that between the, uh, the picture of the defendant at the ATM machine with his cut hands, and, um, and the fact that he's going to testify on his own behalf, which might be a, uh, a completely uh, crazy move in and of itself, uh, she would probably want to let the evidence speak for itself in the opening and then in the closing argument, wallop them with emotion and sentiment and, uh, and put, a, put an end to the case. But you always want to start uh, in an opening statement and go very, very mellow and not promise too many things. Sanford, let me ask you this. What, what, what do you think? I mean, we're not sure what the defense really is. Somebody else done it, or you didn't prove that my guy did it. That seems to be the defense. How, how do you feel Well, first about of all, that? I would add to what he said, and you shove his confession down his throat, starting an opening. In terms of a defense, it looks like maybe reasonable doubt. I don't know what else they have here. But there's something else out there that's a smoking gun. And that's a letter that he wrote when he was in jail saying, hey, guys, I'll plead guilty if you get me better treatment in jail. I don't know if that's going to be admissible, but that's a smoking gun that's out there. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the letter. I just happen to have it here. This goes on. I will, I will tell you, very nice penmanship. Very nice. I, I mean, nothing you can't read here. But he goes on and on about his unfair treatment. Uh, you know, he doesn't like... Uh, rich guys. He has a problem with rich guys. Uh, and he believes he is one of the, um, I guess, discriminated classes known as white and hungry. Uh, so it's all in here. He also suggests he can trade off better treatment to, to fess up to eight other murders. 
So, I mean, is the guy nuts? Is he, you know, crazy like a fox? Uh, Joseph, what are your thoughts? I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of times there's a link between mental illness and crimes. And we haven't done a lot to address that in society. But yeah, that could very well be at play. One of the things that it's kind of a red flag is that he wants to testify in his defense, which, you know, as the panelists are pointing out, that's usually not a good move. But it's always up to the client. If the client wants to testify, the client gets to testify. And that might be one of the reasons why he's testifying. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to keep this guy off the stand from what we've seen, what he's promised. He's even promised that in the penalty phase, he'd like to have a word. So let's go back to the prosecution's opening statement and listen to more. And we're back. This is the Law and Crime Network. Don't forget, coming up at 5 is the Daily Debrief with Aaron Keller. He'll cover things going on coast to coast, gavel to gavel. And we're in the midst of two trials right now. We're live in Texas for the Wesley Matthews case. This is what you're seeing there, some pictures of the site where they found little Sharon Matthews' body after a, a couple of weeks. As you'll recall, the adopted father is... Uh, uh, he's on trial at this point for the penalty to determine what's going to what's going to happen to him after pleading to injury to a child by omission, getting out from under uh, the, the original charge for murder. We think, and I've got a panel here that we've been discussing this. We think that it's primarily because of the difficulty in determining cause of death. Uh, Daniel Leverson is here. Let me uh, let me ask you this. Uh, this is powerful stuff for the jury to see. They, they can now paint this picture pretty gruesomely, right? They do. And what's interesting also at a penalty phase that we're learning today is how uh, so many things can come out. If this was a trial, there could be things such as stipulations. A defense lawyer could, could agree to things that would take away the necessity to have these witnesses come forth and paint such a graphic picture. But as we see in a penalty phase, the prosecution can throw everything in the kitchen sink at the jury in order to uh, evoke sympathy. Yeah, would you agree, Sanford, that this could be really almost irrelevant in the guilt phase because you're going to say, yeah, we know the body was found. We know the body was, she was dead. Do we need this, uh, you know, this uh, graphic mapping and the testimony about the As dog? As a prosecutor, absolutely. Because we have a jury here that has to decide probation or life in jail. So they're painting a picture. A little doll, she looked like a little doll, smiling, and now you have a search for a decomposed body with an odor that is offensive. You go from the doll to the odor of the body and the photograph of where it was found. This jury is going to be impressed with that yeah. in terms of where they're going, probation and, or life. And they're going to be thinking, you know, they're going to picture this little girl's body in a trash bag just tossed out the car or however it got there. Uh, no care, no concern. We know that the father has said, as part of his plea deal, that he did that temporarily because he was going to do some sort of more proper burial at some point. Uh, Dan, how does that play? Well, not too well. Yeah, not too well. Um, but again, it's one of the challenges of a defense lawyer, and people watching the program should appreciate the challenges of a defense lawyer to make sure that their client is, uh, is dealt with in the most fair way possible. And, and advocated in the strongest way possible, but it is certainly a challenging uh, quest for the defense here. What's interesting as well is, will this defendant testify? And if he testifies, how is the prosecutor going to handle him, and how is his own lawyer trying to present him? Okay, so we're going to are we going to go back into the courtroom? What are we going to do? Okay, let's go back into the courtroom now. We're continuing. This is the case in Texas against Wesley Mathers. <music> Welcome back, everybody. We have breaking news out of California. The McStay jurors have reached a verdict after four and a half hours of deliberation. Now, uh, as seems to be uh, the, the case with the jury out there, they have it all planned out. They are going to read the verdict at 345 Pacific time, 645 Eastern time. We will tweet out that verdict when it occurs. And, of course, you can follow up on YouTube la later in the evening and pick out the details there. But the verdict has been arrived at McStay coming up very soon. Thanks to everybody. I'm going to rush and get everybody out of here. Daniel Lieberson, thank you, sir. Sanford Rubenstein, thank you very much. And of course, uh, Joseph Tully, thank you out in California. I appreciate it. Me, Thanks Michael. to everybody. Coming up, the Daily Debrief with Aaron Keller. We'll see you tomorrow. Not the way you normally like to wrap things up.